This is the Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base, California. Here, 8,000 men of the Air Research and Development Command, engineers from 20 major aircraft companies, and scientists of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics are busy flight testing the future of American aviation. It's a big operation. Its birthplace, the world's largest natural airport. Rogers Dry Lake in the Mojave Desert of California. 64 square miles of level rock-hard landing surface hidden from the eyes of the world by a barrier of mountain and desert. History making began here in 1942 during the dark days after Pearl Harbor. A temporary hangar built on the edge of the dry lake housed one of the best kept secrets of the war, the Bell P-59, America's first jet-propelled airplane. For the first time, the desert calm was shattered by the roar of jet engines. A roar that has continued to this day. Opening a new era, in powered flight. From this modest beginning, the Flight Test Center has become one of the most important segments of our air. And the sun-baked sand of the dry lake is some of the most valuable real estate in the world. The pilots who owe their lives to these miles of level landing strip are legion. And because they were able to bring their hot airplanes in safely, they have saved the nation countless millions in dollars, and more important, in research time and equipment. Here are nested the strange new birds of the desert, the X-ships. In 1944, the United States Air Force and the NACA launched a program to explore transonic and supersonic flight, a program calling for the development of the X-series. X for experimental, X for unknown. Planes like the Bell X-5, the Douglas Skyrocket, and the Needle-Nosed X-3 were built to obtain information about high-speed flight, information that was impossible to obtain in the laboratories and wind tunnels of that time. The early x ship brought back the needed information. In 1947, the Bell X-1 blasted through the sound barrier, making its pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Charles E. Yeager, the world's first supersonic human. The movable wings of the Bell X-5 answered many perplexing problems of wing sweep angles. And through its performance, paved the way for the development of today's swept-wing aircraft. Northrop's flying wing, the X-4, investigated the characteristics of a tailless design, checking out its stability and control problems. The Bell X-1A, with Colonel Yeager as pilot, extended the frontiers of flight by reaching 1,650 miles per hour. Six months later, Major Arthur Murray, Air Force pilot, rocketed to 90,000 feet, making the X-1A the world's highest and fastest plane. These then are the flights of discovery, and tomorrow's airplanes will reflect the knowledge gained. The X-ships are the tools of the researcher, carving out the future of American aviation. The workshop is the desert air over Edwards Air Force Base. Let's take a closer look at this birthplace of supersonic flight. Visit Edwards and see for ourselves just what goes into the testing of an X-ship. Meeting the men who are responsible for high-speed research. Men like Lieutenant Colonel Frank K. Everett, 
test fire. Colonel Everett, Pete to his friend, is typical of the men who are symbolized by the whimsical sign over the door. In addition to his flying assignment, Pete is also chief of flight test operations, which calls for administrative duties. Colonel Everest is a member of a very large team, a team that goes beyond the bounds of Edwards Air Force Base and encompasses ARDC in Baltimore, United States Air Force headquarters in Washington, and contractor companies in all parts of the country. Pete flies all kinds of aircraft, but a major task has been testing one of the most important of the nation's flying laboratories, the X-2, a handmade, one-of-its-kind experimental rocket plane. Four years of design, four years' work with new metals, and two years of testing are back of the X-2. This sleek stainless steel plane represents the answer of almost 300 engineers to the problem of aerodynamic heating, the thermal barrier. Why stainless steel? But 40,000 feet and twice the speed of sound, an airplane's surface is hotter than boiling water. Three times the speed of sound, the temperature may reach 565 degrees, a temperature at which aircraft aluminum loses 90% of its strength. The X-2 is being prepared for a motor run now, a tie-down test. A tie-down is just what it says. The X-2 is firmly anchored to the concrete. The plane produces so much power that it might wind up in Los Angeles when the engine fires. It's like trying to harness a hurricane. A tie-down is a sort of dress rehearsal for actual flight. The general procedure is much the same. The fuel truck delivers its load to the X-2, pumping thousands of gallons of alcohol into the tanks of the birds. Preparation for one flight may consume a week or a month. There are thousands of items to check. Normal. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. Other tanks are filled with liquid oxygen. It combines with the alcohol and supports combustion. Acts as an air supply for the motor. Liquid oxygen is cold, almost 300 degrees below zero, and dangerous. You're not even allowed one mistake with this stuff. Attention, attention. There'll be a rocket firing in 30 seconds. All unauthorized personnel clear the danger area. Curtis Wright rocket motor could move a modern battleship at high speed or pull the workload of 15 great locomotives. The X-2's rocket engine is ground tested before every flight. With everything checked out satisfactorily, a flight is scheduled. First, there's a flight briefing attended by the X-2 pilot, crew of the carrier, engineers, and supervisors attached to the project. Every detail is carefully gone over. Okay, take off to 0830. We'll be dropping at 0945 over Victorville. Landing on the Navajo Strip from east to west. Anything else, Pete? I'll shoot for the double line. So be sure all personnel and vehicles are kept 2,000 feet back. While the flight programming is being meticulously screened, the X-2 is also being ready. He's clean. 
streamlined and power packed. The swept wing beauty is towed to the ramp and loaded into the bomb bay of a B-50 converted to carry her along. The X-2 could take off from the ground under her own power, but to save every drop of fuel for high altitude runs, the B-50 lifts her five or six miles into the air. Then the X-2 takes over, almost like a two-stage rocket, climbing, reaching for 10 or 15 more miles of thin-aired space. Each step higher gives man new altitudes to conquer. Someday, the moon. But that's the future. Right now, we're laying the groundwork. Come on, a little more, a little more. That's it. Hold it. Hey, go. Over the 50. The two birds are finally made. Now come the final hours of preparation. Checking, examining, and re-examining all through the night. The routine of flight testing. A slow, methodical, round-the-clock routine. The pilot's day starts early. Quick breakfast, quick goodbyes. His is a challenging job, but it's part of a routine. Now, the schedule takes over. Nothing is left to chance. The checklist becomes your only master. Checking and double-checking is your margin of safety. This is where it begins, in a locker room. But the big game is the serious work of research. Research that may save the nation's aviation industry years of effort, millions of dollars, and countless lives. Attention, attention, all flight personnel assembled by the B-50. Here is the flight team, the crew, the observers, and a young man from a small town in West Virginia. A career Air Force officer the pilot of a multi-million dollar flying laboratory. This is the man who is the key to years of work, concentrated days of preparation. The X-2 carries instruments, a quarter ton of them, that radio to ground details of stress, strain, and temperature. But this is the man who gathers the vital information. He sits alone in the nose of the bomber, seemingly relaxed, but totally conscious of the assignments ahead. He sits alone, but the hundreds of engineers, technicians, Air Force personnel who have lived with the X-2 are riding with him. Southwest 7, clear for takeoff, over. High-speed jets carrying cameramen and observers take off to join the B-50 and X-2. These are the chase planes which observe and report on the X-2 as long as they can keep up with the rocket-powered track. The B-50 is now reaching for its rendezvous, the launching altitude for the X-2. The last checks are being made. Item 14, check. Front panel camera on. Okay, feet, we're at 7,000 feet. Enter the X-2 cockpit. Okay, Dad. Oxygen pressure normal. Warning system switch on. Pressure demand regulator on. Check. Emergency temperature off. Off. Check. Deputy to chase. This is LB50. How do you read me? Over. I have a loud and clear. At 100 chase. This is LB50. How do you read me? Over. Loud and clear, Dad. Okay, install canopy. Thank you, Dad. 
successful this the next poses. One nonchalant. It sounds so nonchalant. It looks so routine. But this is the moment before the curtain lifts. Man and plane pitted against Not heat and space. Jack, ready anytime. Hammer's on. Okay, Pete, we can drop you any time. Give me the word for the countdown. Okay, Dad, counting from five to one. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, drop away. goes. On the ground, the radar registers the height and speed of the plane, now invisible from the ground. Every detail of the plane's performance is recorded. Instruments measuring the forces exerted on the X-2 during flight. Temperature, Fuel consumption, strains, stresses. Watch that baby go. I wonder how he feels now. Feel? You're too busy to feel anything. Your hands are full with one of the hottest ships ever built. You're blasting into unknown regions of speed, temperature, altitude. One pilot and one plane collecting information that will determine the designs of tomorrow. The course for flight into the future is being charted, up where the world looks round. A little closer to the stars. Now is the time man makes history alone, out of sight, except to the cold metallic eye of radar whose humming recorders measure the flight's progress as a single mechanical line. For anxious observers on the ground, there is only the empty sky. Endless, unresponsive. That's 86 case, this is bell control. Can you see him, over? Negative, out of sight, too high. Holy, there he is. I see him. 10 o'clock high, heading north fast. He shut off power and he's gliding. Hey, Pete, this is F-86. Do you read me? Yeah, boy. I'm about 10 miles north of the base, about 30,000. I have you. How'd you go, Dad? Fine and dandy. No sweat. Does everything look okay on the outside? I'm still catching up. Okay from here, Pete. Good deal. I'm over the south end of the lake. I'm going to make a left hand pattern. Deer coming down. Okay, boy, on my final, I've got about 200 indicated. Give me my altitude on landing. Then about 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet. Good. Looks good. Mighty fine. Pete Everest is hardly out of the cockpit when the post-flight interrogation begins. 
Question, question, question. They will go on for hours, for days. The pilot's reactions will be matched with those of the recording instrument he carried miles into the sky. And during all this, the next flight is being planned. For flight testing is a never-ending series of steps, each one contributing to America's leadership in the air. Leadership that can only be maintained by constant probing into the unknown. Today's first-line planes are the result of yesterday's planning. And in the accelerated rush of modern air technology, only two types of airplanes can exist. Those so new they are experimental, or so old they are obsolescent. Flight testing is a plunge into the future. Tomorrow we'll find the X-2, or another of these complex birds, being readied for further assaults on the far frontiers of flight. There is only one goal of air research, progress. There is only one motto. It can be read at the gate of Edwards Air Force Base. Ad inexplorata, toward the unexplored, toward the unconquered.